So yeah, thanks all for joining. Welcome to our continuous delivery journey. Um, what you can expect to hear today is an overview of HPE and our group, where we started from five years ago, uh, the challenges we had with that and how that sparked the need for change, um, setting out what was our goal, how did we make the change, both from a process and org perspective, but also a you know, high level of technically how we did it, um, the benefits of making that change and what it enabled for us as an organization, some lessons learned, and I guess lessons we're still learning, right? We definitely haven't learned everything. And then some, some conclusions and Q&A um, after that. So if I look at uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, HPE is a global edge to cloud platform as a service company uh, built to transform our customers' businesses. Our, our purpose is to advance the way people live and work, whether that's partnering with scientists on uh, memory driven computing to advance our ability to cure disease or working with Mercedes in Formula One or IT transformations for thousands of our customers across the globe. You know, within HPE, um, myself and Richard are part of HPE Point Next Services, which brings IT expertise to all of our customers. You know, we deliver over 11,000 transformation projects a year across 200 countries. So you get a sense of the, the scale within which we operate. Within Point Next Services R&D then, um, Richard and I sit um, within that group. Our main focus is the digital customer experience, which automates remote support, reduces delivery costs, and improves the total customer support experience. At a practical level, that can mean automatically detecting an event uh, on a piece of hardware and sending a replacement part or sending an engineer to site automatically. It can mean being able to easily search and download and install a software update. It can mean being easily able to check warranty of your products. It can, be, it can mean being able to easily access knowledge documentation when you need it. In terms of our group, we're a, a worldwide workforce, uh, 750 plus agile scrum teams. We have 60 and we're based in Ireland, the US, Germany, and India primarily. Um, you know, technology-wise, we are Java predominantly with Salesforce and Apex coding ramping up over the last 12 months with a lot of our services, excuse me, now running in a container environment. So Richard and I work within the group in a team focused on solution maintenance, automation, and reliability. We're just over 100 people, and our, our team is responsible for building out the technical pipeline uh, to release value to our customers and all the tooling that goes along with that, whether that's CICD tooling, security, performance, release management, supportability, you know, whatever that tooling may be. And so, you know, in terms of uh, the scale, we have 71,000 connected customers. We have 650 million files transferred per month um, from our customer sites. We have 1.2 million connected devices. And then our, 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 our flagship website, the HPE Support Center, has over 17 million visits per year. So now that you have an overview of kind of who we are, where we sit within the organization, uh, let's jump into the use case. Uh, so if I go you know, back in time, to five years ago, you know, our, our group was as waterfall as the Iwazu Falls in Argentina, which is pictured here on the right. You know, with many you know, waterfall programs, we had a, a rigid structure. It was date and scope driven with little flexibility. We did quality at the end, little to no automation. Deployment to production took a long time. You know, often there were weekend affairs. There was a, a certain amount of fear and trepidation around deploying something in production because you never quite knew what was going to happen. Uh, we were limited to three or four deployments a year. Um, and if you look at the, the, the downward facing arrow here, the, the wait time our customers had for to get value into their hands was huge. Um, you know, as with most waterfall organizations, you know, the only choice was to barrel forward. You know, as you can imagine, in the picture on the right-hand side, if you were to try and navigate, you might get left or right. And even if you do manage to get to the, the bank of the river in, in a waterfall project, it's a, it's a huge lift to go back and you know, redesign what you've spent months designing and developing. You know, um, one of the, the major 
you know, pitfalls is that end users may not know what they want. You can miss an opportunity or worse still deliver exactly what you set out to deliver. Um, and it be a technical success, but no one to actually use it when it gets to production because your cycle time has been so long. Um, and then the other thing you know, I want to point out is cost of delay. So this skyrockets in the waterfall model. If I look at the sample here that I've used just for illustrative purposes, if we take a, or, or that our support costs are $200,000 a day, and we've identified a feature that will be able to reduce that support cost by 1%, then our cost of delay, every, every day that we don't deploy that feature to production, it's costing us $2,000. And if you look at that, uh, you know, when we were doing three or four releases a year, you know, that the cost of that one feature being delayed by three months is up on 180,000. And so, with all of these factors, we decided we needed to make a change or we weren't going to be able to satisfy the needs of our customers moving forward. So when we decided we wanted to make the change, the first thing was to decide on what was our goal? What did we want the change to enable? Um, and two words come to mind here, cycle time. We wanted the smallest possible time between the inception of an idea and getting feedback from an end user while keeping the quality high. That's the key point. If I equate this to the, you know, the simple example in the slide, a requirement comes in from a customer. They want to get from point A to point B faster. Working with the customer, you know, we come up with uh, the car as the correct requirement at that point in time. We have a quick estimation and you know, using the waterfall approach, it's going to take four months to deliver that to the client. But if we take a different approach, an iterative incremental approach, and look at the principle of getting value to our customers as soon as possible, in one month we can deliver a scooter, which will enable the customer to move towards a goal. That will get them from point A to point B faster. In two months we could deliver a bike, and we build on that functionality, and in four months we deliver a car. And so instead of it being four months for the customer to realize any value and then make tweaks to the product, um, they get a product in one month, they get an, a, an incremental product in two months, and then they get the best possible product because of the feedback they've been able to provide you in four months. And you know, if you're a country boy like me, it, maybe at the start you didn't know this, but you also wanted a tractor um, to, you know, to pull a trailer of cattle across the country, for instance. And because of the customer experience that you've been given with the constant feedback loop, taking in to account exactly what you want, allowing the customer to iterate through the process, you know, you're more likely to give that repeat business to, this, to the same company. Um, then if you went with the model above, where really you were involved at the start and then just had a, a long wait, wait time. So your know, key point, customer gets value quickly, feeds back what she likes, doesn't like about each stage. Without this quick feedback loop, we're always in danger of delivering something the customer doesn't necessarily want or isn't exactly the right thing after four months. So now that you know why we needed to make the change and our goal as we set out to make that, I'll hand you over to Richard to show you how we made them changes. Thanks, Kieran. So, so we decided looking at the, what slides put together here, what word to put as a subtitle for how we made a change we said on culture. It's not the only thing, but it's a really, really vital and probably the most important thing. So this is more, much more than a, a technical challenge. Um, so, you know, when it was decided um, this is what we wanted to do, um, you know, we're going from a, a, an old school waterfall of an organization to an agile continuous delivery organization, better look to change. And um, there's process, like I said, process as well as technology. And um, we knew that we continued what we'd always done. And Kieran's alluded to this, you know, we wouldn't be able to meet the demands of our customers or our stakeholders. And, um, you know, the landscape is evolving rapidly uh, in terms of what we what we do in terms of the digital customer experience. It's not just about cost, it's also about differentiating the business um, from, uh, you know, from our competitors. So we knew we had to change. Um, and that's why we had the backing of senior leadership. Like, they understood why we wanted to do this and they understood why it was the right approach. Um, you know, they provided the funding to transform our organization, um, but also in terms of how they behave towards us, and um, they changed how they behave, recognizing that need, that was necessary as well. It's a massive mind shift, mindset change. And, you know, we're still, you know, do that today. This is not a kind of do it once and you're done. Um, so how do we do that? We brought in consultants to help us transform. 
we we also hired and developed coaches um, and we've um, done a lot of training as well um, and we continue to do so. It's really important that it's a continuous journey. Um, to do that, we've grown our own in-house trainers. So a number of people on this call are actually certified trainers. Um, the idea of that is keep the knowledge fresh and um, inculcate that culture in new people that come in and um, new partners that come in, new executives that come in because as things change and people get involved, they have to understand the culture as well. Um, that culture is one of continuous learning and experimentation. Um, you know, science and experimentation, when Dave Farley came to us um, a couple of years ago, um, he emphasized strongly the scientific method. You know, positive hypothesis, design the experiment, conduct the experiment, draw your conclusions. Um, and that really stuck with us. Um, you know, failure is common and we encourage that, that experimental behavior, because it gives more data to make future decisions. Not always easy. Not always easy to encourage failure. There's always a push pull between the business wanting and needing something and, and us wanting to make how we work better and more sustainable. So it's a constant push pull and that's where the reinforcement matters. We're never really done. Um, you know, we've built in fast feedback loops and Kieran's going to talk about radiators in a, in a short while um, to help us see the impact of what we do. And again, lean agile thinking. And always look and see where you can eliminate waste and make things work better. Um, I talked about my culture and people and um, psychological safety is massively important and um, you have to always consider individual psychology and team dynamics. As I was saying, you can tell computers what to do and they'll do it, um, but people not so much, so a little bit more to it than giving instructions. New ways of working can cause fear, uncertainty, doubt, as all certainties and comforts are removed. Leaders need to manage that. Um, we as leaders need to model their right behaviours, we need to display empathy to people who have concerns and help to address those. There's work done by behavioural economists and um, like Cameron Sunstein and psychologists like Cameron Tversky, which is very good in this. And that's not in the technology domain or the management domain necessarily, but uh, we found it really, really useful. So what did we change? I suppose the first thing. So we committed to change our methodology. I've moved to the scaled agile framework. Um, which would be familiar to a number of people on this call. Um, you know, where Scrum is focused very much on the team unit and what happens within that team unit and the customer. Uh, safe scale that up to a large organization, like here in the 750 of us. And so individual Scrum needs a bit more. Um, and we have adopted this. We've been working with this for the last roughly six years. Um, the other thing is then we, we developed our own pipeline. Now, if this looks familiar compared to what Dave Farley showed us, a few weeks ago on, in ITAG, and that's because you know he was heavily influential in that. Um, and we took what we learned from Dave and what we researched and, and built our own. It's not exactly the same, but you can see the similarities. So, you know, code, I won't go into a lot of detail in this, but you can see the kind of thing that happens, you know, from developers to repositories to commits, running tests and deployments, running more tests, non functional requirements at various stages, you no know, staging. Um, Explore testing, we do blue green, we flip active passive production, and we use toggles to, to activate features um, and put them in front of the customer. And we do this continuously. We also reviewed, reinforced, introduced, you know, several practices that some were been done, some we need to bring in. Community of practice, um, very important. You know, get people talking, people in part of improvement, definition of ready and pairing. Different methods, I'll talk about it in a few minutes when we talk about testing. Also, TDD, SRs, you know, increased automation and increased use of test data and test doubles, such as, as, as mocks or stubs, to help test early and often. So we've also looked, you know, closely at the principles of continuous delivery and, you know, what they mean to us. So we, we don't treat these things as, you no know, points in a slide or a board. We look to how, how we model them. So. Creator of people live across releasing software. That's what we've done and continue to, to enhance. Automate almost everything. Absolutely, absolutely critical. And um, to do that to the greatest extent possible. Version everything that includes infrastructure as code, includes pipeline as code, as well as, as everything else, just regular, you know, code. If it hurts, do it more often. Get bring the pain forward, get it done. And um, again, Dave Farley talked about some of this stuff and uh, his colleague is humble as well. And um, that's important. Don't wait till the wrong part of the process to, to run into problems. Build quality in. Absolutely, absolutely critical. 
I'll talk about that more shortly. Done means in the hands of users delivering value. Again, it's not done because it's an integrated environment. It's not done because it's in quote unquote system tests. It's done when people can use it. Everybody is responsible for the release process. Um, and this is particularly important when things go wrong. You know, in a continuous delivery environment, if it goes, if something fails, it goes wrong. You know, we swarm it, we get things moving again. That's the most important thing, not the next feature. Improve continuously, like I said. So create a process, yes, but then keep improving it, keep working on that. Work in small batches. If anyone's had the joy of reading Slow um, by Don Weinertson, they'll know this is a, a big thing for him. You know, the smaller the batch you have, the better, more feedback you get. So as an example of this, um, say you've got 10 envelopes that you want to kind of insert something into, fold, seal, stamp, get out the door. Chances are we're not doing this in our day job as IT professionals, but if anyone's involved in a club or society, it may be something to do. Um, if it takes 10 seconds to be each step, you know, um, if your batch size is one, it's 40 seconds. Not bad, you can get feedback straight away to say, this isn't sealed properly, or there's a typo in the letter or whatever. If you do all 10, it's 400 seconds. And that's the first time you get feedback to know something's wrong. And if there is something wrong, then you gotta undo everything and redo it. So not only you find out later, there's a problem, you're delivering your full solution later and it's more expensive. So it's much like the small batches are, are much, much better. There's a sweet spot. You know, one is not always the right batch size because there's transaction costs, but nonetheless, there's a, somewhere between one and 10. It's definitely less than 10. And the last one, and one of my favorites, computers perform repetitive tasks, people solve problems. Don't have people doing things that computers can do. Automated that, that that person or people think and, and work on making things better. Okay, let's talk about the pipeline itself. I'm gonna hand back to Kieran. Yeah, so in terms of the technical makeup of the pipeline, you know, over the last five years of this journey, you know, we've iterated on different things, changed things out, um, replaced specific tooling or technologies. But you know, the guiding principles have been what Richard just went through from a continuous delivery perspective. You know, every step puts an emphasis on visualizing reliable data for two reasons. One, you'll make a manual decision to move forward, or two, even better, discover the data that allows us to build in automated decisions and move on with no need to pause. So, you know, we try to use a, a minimal set of tools to expose the data we need to move through each step of the process and um, with the our goal always front of mind, how do we deliver frequently value to our customers with high quality? So if we take the top right is integration, you know, we use GitHub as our single source of truth. Uh, you know, all of our work items start from there. There's a number of checks here for code quality, unit tests, um, security, you know, some are you know, mandatory as part of the commit process, others are optional and you know, based on what the engineers are working on, they may um, do several checks here before they commit to master. If the PR passes, the pull request passes all the automated code checks, it'll be built into a deployable artifact. And once it passes the automated build quality steps, it's deployed to one of our test environments. So we have several test environments. We have a, a, in our pipeline, we have a functional test environment, an integration test environment, and a staging or pre-production or passive pro environment. It's called multiple things. So there are iteratively more stringent checks Mute there, Karen. We lost Karen. He's muted himself there. Yeah, don't know how that happened. Am I back? <laughs> can you yeah, hear me? Can hear you. Yeah. Okay, grand. <laughs> okay, so you know, once we're once deployed, you know, a set of automated checks, automated tests, checks or APIs, and uh, checks are from a UI perspective uh, that are functional or functional use case is as it should be. If them two checks pass, we have a performance suite of tests that runs on a nightly basis. And then we have a robust dynamic security scan that runs every weekend, which complements our static security analysis tools that, that happen as they're earlier in the process on our code. At each point in the process, we visualize our results so teams, individuals, or others know whether they need to take action on a failure. Production, once all of our quality checks are validated and our teams indicate the product is ready to go, we deploy to production. Um, notice that I say deploy, not release. 
Uh, we have a mechanism where we can deploy without releasing to our customers, but we'll get into that a little bit later in the use case. Again, in production, we use a small suite of products to gather both operational and user data, and this allows us to make the best decisions in terms of where we invest our engineering effort moving forward. Um, you know, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail as well, but I think first I'll hand back to Richard to go through the CICD build system. So the build system, as we've said multiple times, continuous delivery is not just about technology, and um, it's about many more things. However, the CICD system underpins continuous delivery. It cannot work without it. Um, and that, the, the picture you see was drawn by, not me, but by someone who's on this call. Uh, I won't stress them out by suggesting anyone comments on it or explains it, um, but it's just to give an idea of how much goes on. Um, and that technology has to be considered business critical, particularly a global organization. If that pipeline is down or is impeded in any way, then the organization's output queues up and can't realize value. And if you've got hundreds of hundreds of engineers globally doing so, you do not want it stuck somewhere along the way. Um, that's really important, especially like I said, 24 hours. Uh, Kieran and I and some people in this call have endured some fairly uncomfortable moments over the years as we've matured this and the, the amount of code going into the pipeline has expanded hugely, even exponentially over the years. Um, Jenkins is the center of it, as is for many organizations, the engine of most CICD. Um, but we've evolved that system. Um, we have to build in supportability, recoverability, portability, uh, security, performance, all these things, and like NFRs, I suppose, and, and visualizations to make sure it is as up and efficient and effective as possible. It is absolutely critical to our mission about an organization. Here, thank you. Yeah, so jumping back to that, our supportability stack, really, which is paramount importance in production, but is used throughout the pipeline in our different environments. And um, so as Dave Farley said in one of her, his earliest interactions with us, you know, use a, use a small set of tools and use them everywhere. And that's what we've tried to emulate with the supportability stack. So on the left hand side, you'll see our logging flow. And um, basically logs on a server are pulled by Filebeat. They're published to a Kafka topic. Uh, Logstash subscribes to the topic and then consumes the log messages. They're grokked and indexed in Elastic and made visual on Kibana. And you know, what does this give us, right? So, so the days of logging into each individual server to tail the logs on different applications is gone. This is a centralized logging solution. So if you're trying to debug or pinpoint an issue um, in production or in any of our earlier pre-prod environments, you go to one place, you go to Kibana, and you're able to push uh, a graphical representation depending on what you want to, to search on. On the right hand side is our metrics flow. So, you know, we have a couple of different type of endpoint exporters, but basically metrics are published, which are then scraped by Prometheus um, at an interval from the exporter or the app. Uh, they're stored in a time series database. And then on top of this, we can build alerts based on thresholds. Um, and that allows us to via our PagerDuty tool you know, alert, you know, an engineer, if something onerous or there's an issue happening in production, it allows us to call someone out of bed if needed. But thankfully, through all of the, the process and quality that we've been able to build in, um, you know, them calls out of bed at two o'clock in the morning are few and far between. Uh, on the other side, then, we have a UI in Grafana where we can basically visualize all that data. We can slice it and dice it any way we want to see. Again, it's another, you know, tool in our tool belt to be able to diagnose problems as and when they happen. You know, as, as I said, it's, it's of paramount importance on production, but you know, prior to production and to stop getting them 2 a.m. call out via pager duty, we have a comprehensive testing process that happens up to that point, and I think Richard's going to cut through that next. So yeah, so, so testing, I mean, the, obviously we'd like not to have defects or minimize them altogether. But while they are a thing, you know, finding them faster and earlier and how you respond to them is key to continuous delivery. So, you know, first part of that is putting the right tests in the right places. Um, we use the concept of the test pyramid um, to focus the attention of the tests in the right areas, like we said. Um, I mentioned shift left earlier, and that's a key part of that. So really driving more and more small tests at early stages so that we find those defects or any problems closer to them as possible. 
Um, obviously, you know, doing that means they're faster and much cheaper to fix because it's, we're not interrupting flows. Um, it does require, you know, investment. You know, we have to invest in automation tools, um, but also not just that investment, but also the investment inside the regular flow of work. It means that, you know, features and store, user stories we deliver in an agile way have to include automation. They have to include creation of test doubles, be it stubs or mocks or other forms of that to replicate external services and create test data. You know, we don't want a situation where code has to wait to get some integrated environment to fix something. And, you know, that does happen. There's no getting away from that. But we're trying to move it, ship it further and further left. When I say ship left, we mean earlier in the process, in the left-right process. So if we can do those tests early, find the problems, fix them, we're not finding them later on. Because when we find them later on, they're more expensive, as I said, to fix, because we've got to go back and interrupt other work. It takes more time to do it. And it slows down getting stuff released. You know, if you find something, if you find a, an important a major defect, you know, the day before release, well, obviously that's highly impactful. If you find the same defect, uh, you know, three weeks before release, obviously it's much less of a problem. And to do that, as I said, we maximize automation, massively important. Manual tests are expensive and it's not repeatable and it's not nearly as reliable. As well as that, we need to simplify. So, you know, as part of our strategy, we said we need to make sure we all speak the same language. So, you know, we send it from the Google testing framework. And so we, we try to stop talking about things like functional system integration, unit test, sit, foot, bat, UAT, all these different things that people used to hear it. And, and we've adopted this convention, small, medium, large convention, and, you know, very clear delineation on what they are. Sorry, press the button there. Okay, so the whole point of this is that testing is easy to understand, easy to do, gets the right results, gets them early. And again, it's a mindset thing. If people are, are accustomed to, you know, old ways of, you know, write your code, do you need test, merge and throw the fence for QA team to deal with, this is different and it's a, it's a challenge because it can be seen as extra work before you get anything, but look at the big picture, it's what helps us get more things done more quickly. Kieran. Yeah, so we try to build in information radiators or feedback loops at every stage. And, and you know, it starts in GitHub where through webhooks, like Richard just talked about, we can run small, medium, large tests, we could run deploy tests, we can run sonar tests, uh, we can run, you know, a combination of all of them or other things, you know, before we commit that code to master at all, right? Um, and that's the first form of feedback loop in terms of when we start the work to deliver that to production. We also have a continuous delivery pipeline dashboard in, in the top left here. And what that does is it visualizes the, the status of all of our deploy and test jobs for every repo, across all of our environments. We have four different pipelines right now um, in, in different architectures, I guess you would say, and it allows teams to see what's working, what's not, and where we need to invest time or fix something. And lastly, I wanted to cover like the, the power of real-time visual feedback. And so this is something that resonated with me, um, I think it was last year. So I live in Ormore, but I'm from Currafin originally. And so anyone that knows the road, to Curfin, which I've driven hundreds of times. It goes or and more, Clare Galway, through Nocto and into Curfin uh, along the N17. And I would consider myself a very safe driver. Uh, I would always obey the speed limit, uh, or so I thought, uh, until they put um, this speed limit feedback screen that you'll see in the top right or Stein um, in Nocto village, right? And for the first probably 10 times I drove up to that village, Every time before that, I thought I'd driven the speed limit. But for the first 10 times after they put that sign up, I was over the limit coming into that village. Um, and it really resonated with me, the power of that visual cue. I thought I was doing everything right, but when it was radiated towards me that, hang on, you're above the speed limit here, I was able to take a corrective action and make sure that from that point on, I was always under the speed limit because I could see it. It was radiated back to me. Um, and I think it's one of the... the biggest things from a, from a transformation perspective to be able to visualize what you're doing and radiate that out to, to the folks it matters to. Um, okay, back to you, Richard. Thanks. And yeah, they actually put those up in Crockwell uh, not long ago, those, those same kind of 
speed limits. Unfortunately, not everyone Crockwell obeys them. Um, some people on this call, but we'll, we'll leave that there for the moment <laughs> and talk about value stream mapping instead. So, in large organizations like, like ours, a uh, pipeline, as I said, consists of large process. Um, they can be automated, they can be manual, especially early on as you're getting started. And it's absolutely critical to find and eliminate inefficiencies um, you know, early and often to kind of never ending cost as well. And, and value stream mapping is a technique that we use. So what value stream mapping do, it, it, as it says here, it rather than saying what value and not value, shows what activities matter and those that don't. And um, helps to improve, not to improve a process. What's preventing the flow, where are the bottlenecks? And um, as it says, it reduces variability. Um, we can never eliminate variability, that's what it says it reduces, but we can reduce it. And again, it provides visibility to the whole organization of the time to value. So what's on the screen there is, is just really a basic example. Um, I'm gonna show you what our example looks like right now. So we did we did this mapping. And as you can see, um, first thing we did was we, we identified every process step in the flow. And this was fairly recent, usually more steps. And um, you have to gather data on your process time, your wait time, and also what's called percent complete and accurate, um, which basically says how much of the work from any process step is ready for the next process step. So those three pieces of information are really, really powerful because they can show you, for example, your lead time is your process time plus the time you're waiting to do it. Um, and that wait time is waste. So it immediately shows you when you do this exercise, you can see how long your end-to-end -end takes. You can see how long, how much of that end-to-end -end time is actually conducting value adding activities, and you can show how well you're doing it. Okay, so when you do that, it gives you a map and a picture, and you can see that here. So this is the kind of flow and all the activities. This starts to tell us actually how good we are at each of those activities and what they are. And you can look at this and see where the value is. So it instantly gives time, gives an opportunity to the organization to us to go, well, here's something we need to drill it down into. Here's something we need to focus on. Rather than looking, stepping back and going, you know, What's the problem here? Why is it taking me so long for an engineer to say, you know, I wrote this code, you know, today, and why isn't it live? And um, I'm finished. Uh, what's taking so long to get there? And here's how you can tell. And it gives you where, again, you know, it tells you and it tells you such a way you can take action. And again, then just down here in the corner, we automate the collection of this data so that anytime we identify a change, we can put into a backlog and um, for whatever team needs to do something. Once that's completed and goes live, we can see if it makes a difference. So we can, again, inspect and adapt on our own improvement process. Um, we found this a, a really powerful tool. Um, and again, from our point of view, Kieran and I and other people is called work in the space where we work on these tools. Um, it shows evidence for the value that we offer. So that's the key thing, is eliminating waste, automating things, improving how things work. Uh, but that measurement piece is key. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So to give an example of, of waste reduction to automation, um, this example, um, most organizations have some kind of change control for production environments. Um, ours is called the Request for Change, or RFC. Um, in a big complex organization like ours, there are strict processes, and they're across the board, they're universal around production environments. We have sarbanes obsolete compliance. We have all sorts of regulatory um, you know, compliance things we have to do, you know, there's an awful lot of, you know, uh, commercial data, a lot of security, so a lot of things there. And the process is very heavy, very manual, very time consuming. Um, it's all fit for purpose in a continuous delivery world. So it was one of the things we said, we need to hit this, we need to do something. So, you know, we looked at it and between automation, documentation, negotiation with the people that control this system, this whole process, and having our tools and process audited, we've been able to go from this, which is a reputation of the time, representation of the time it takes the manual RFC process, to this. If you can't see that, there it is. Okay, massive difference. Okay, as you can see, and we, we couldn't do continuous delivery without that, quite frankly. And but that gives them a, an an idea of you know, identifying one area that's a blockage, and going at it hard and dealing with it and reaping the benefits. Sure. Yeah, so I guess with everything that we talked about, you know, the, the shift from 
or previous methodology into safe uh, complement to continuous delivery. You know, what were the outcomes that that enabled? So you can jump onto the next slide there, Richard. So it allowed us to change the way we release and interact with our customers. Right? It allowed us to have a phased release approach. Um, and so we have three phases in, in our go-to-market strategy. The first one, dark launch, basically deployed to production, but not released to our customers. Um, it, the only consumers of that are internal to point next services R&D. It enables testing of background and foreground processes in actual production environment uh, before exposing functionality to our users. For us to learn, to have a feedback loop for ourselves, um, in complicated or complex services that we need to deliver um, into production. The second phase is, you know, canary release phase. So provide the ability to release value to part of the user population. So whether that's a handful of pilot customers, whether that's 10% of the user base, whether that's just the people in Ireland, you know, we can target a, a, a customer group or a set of customers um, and expose them to new functionality, new services or new products. Um, and again, build in a feedback loop so we can say, if this 100 customers is on our new product and they have this feedback, does that mean we then spec that out to a higher level of our customer population? Or do we need to revisit it or make some tweaks to the service before we push that out? And then the third one is generally available. So full functionality, the full product, full service is available to all of our authorized users. And so they're the three phases that we have to date and we use these quite frequently. And next slide. So I, I think I saw in the in the chat, you know, what did our or change from CICD, or sorry, from waterfall to continuous delivery enable from a deployment perspective, right? And I don't have 2021 on here yet, but basically in 2016, we had four major releases to the production. Based on where we were, you know, that's what we could accommodate and that's how we, um, and that's all we were able to do in 2016. You can see we grew our capability through 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, you know, it exploded to over 40 as we mature in our processes. And so far this year, we're, we're over 80 deployments into production. So I think there's a, a difference between deployment and release. So we've done 85 deployments, but not all of that functionality is released to customers yet. As I went through in the last slide, you know, some of that is in the dark launch phase, some of it's in the canary release phase, and some of it, yes, is generally available to all of our customers. Other benefits, you know, higher quality and repeatable, you know, because of the value we place on automation, everything we do becomes more repeatable. Um, it doesn't tax those involved by redoing manual tasks that we can have automation take over. You know, I truly believe in the model engineer and automate our way out of this year's job. There'll always be more business requirements. There'll always be more customers to satisfy. There'll always be innovation that can take place. Um, and so we try and look at our bottlenecks or manual processes and automate them as best we can. You know, example in terms of you know, return on investment, Richard had the slide earlier around the Jenkins ecosystem. You know, it used to take us going back a number of years, a couple of days, if if we had a hardware problem, uh, you know, and potentially lost a, a master node from Jenkins, you know, that could take us a couple of days to get back all of the associated data, jobs, and history. You know, through the automation that team has built, you know, that's down under 30 minutes now and is a fully automated process. Uh, you know, over the last few years, we've scaled the organization from a people perspective to 450 to 500 people up to what we are today, which is 750 plus. Um, and, you know, if we hadn't made the change, you know, going back four to five years from our waterfall process to where we are now, we would not be able to deliver, you know, what we're delivering from a value perspective to our customers. Faster cycle times, you know, I'll take the, the example of our first, you know, functional test environment where we deploy our artifacts to. Back a number of years ago, and I know a number of people on the call were involved in this, you know, we would struggle to deploy to that environment twice a day and to keep it stable. You know, we have a superb 
group of engineers and through their you know hard work and innovation we went from twice a day to that environment to four times a day to that environment to 12 times a day to that environment and now we deploy on every successful commit to master now, similarly in our integration environment where we do all of our security and performance testing um, at the start we would have struggled to deploy to that once a week now we deploy after every successful build and test in our functional environment and performance testing runs nightly and gives engineers that fast feedback in that facet as well employee satisfaction you know one of the pieces of feedback that, that we've got from our engineers is you know, they always want to work on the latest technologies and tools. They always want some meaty problem to um, to experiment with, to overcome. And you know, working in this space with the latest tools and technology definitely allows people to do that. The other thing, and you know, unfortunately I've seen the other side of this in previous roles, is engineers want to see their creations get used by customers and get feedback from real life users. Um, and this model enables that where previous models and in previous companies I've seen, you know, we could deliver everything we were asked for you know, on time, exact requirements, and potentially it never gets used because there hasn't been that iterative feedback loop to make sure what we're building is, is the right thing. Data-driven decisions, you know, I think we've, we've talked about this, information radiators at every stage, allow everyone in the organization, you know, to take decisions based on data, um, and it allows us to solve issues before they get to production, before it's seen by our customers. And um, it also allows, as Richard's gone through with the VSM, it allows us to visualize and fix bottlenecks in our pipeline. And you know, I, re I remember in our group specifically, you know, when we spun that up first, we were able to pinpoint areas straight away. Once we had a visual on it, we were able to pinpoint areas straight away that we would be able to, to make progress on overcoming some of our bottlenecks. And then more time for innovation. I think I touched on this already. You know, the more automation, the more visual cues you have, the less time you spend in reactive mode and firefighting. And this allows for continued innovation to enable us to, to delight our customers. Okay, um, and yeah, back over to you, Richard. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Um, so this, this slide is really called lessons learned, um, but then I realized that we probably learned everything. Um, so that's not true. Um, so we changed it. So now it's what are we learning? Um, because no one's ever fully learned. So what are we learning? Well, we're never done learning, number one. Um, but closely behind that, organizational buy-in is an absolute must. Um, you can't do this unless your organization is behind you because, and this has been a struggle. Um, you know, despite very strong buy-in, we still bump, have bumped up against this kind of thing in the past where the, 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 there's always a temptation to, to, to bend or go around the process to get some, achieve some deadline. And so, you know, over the years, you know, we've had debates and disputes like any organization does about that. Um, so it's not just buying up front, it's, it's continual buy-in and, and that's, they our own R&D management, our own portfolio product people, but also our stakeholders across the company, right up to and including the chief executive, who is, you know, the in this initial we'll work on is one of the top priorities of the company as a whole. So, you know, get a lot of attention. Um, and it's important that we're set up for sustainability and we work and we don't kind of break things just to get the next, you know, key deliverable that's been presented somewhere. So it's always a bit of a push and pull in an organization to do that. Um, start small. One way to get that, that buy-in is to prove it works. Um, and if you can find a, a small part of your overall machine, development machine, that you can apply the principles to and show it working, that's how you get credibility. That is the number one best way, better than any set of slides, um, however good those slides may be, um, to do that. Okay, And um, that's how you overcome skepticism. Continuous delivery needs to be considered in big decisions, um, particularly business architecture decisions, particularly on technology investment. Um, before, you know, if you make technology based on the feature functionality it offers or integration or it's very popular marketplace or cost and um, many, many factors. But if you don't consider continuous delivery, it can cause major problems. Um, you know, 
if you if you try to integrate a technology into your pipeline that doesn't support CD, it's going to slow things down. Um, you know, we've we've encountered this, we've dealt with it, um, but it's a fact that if this is considered up front, it may it may influence the decisions that are made. And it's far better to do that early, like most things, um, than try to recover afterwards. Monolithic architectures have to be decoupled. We had a major, you know, getting started, we had that challenge where, as I always said, you know, this architecture would be great if you could drop it in out of nowhere, but building it is going to be difficult. Um, because of, like I said, if you try to continuously release or deploy code that has dependencies all over the place, um, it's going to keep breaking. And that's what we found. And we have uh, uh, had a, an initiative to, to decouple that architecture and break it into, into domains which has made a massive difference to our ability to deploy and release, as you saw, as you saw with Kieran's slide earlier. Don't sacrifice automation quality for more stuff. Um, as again, I talked about a minute on the an organizational buy-in. The temptation is always to go and build stuff um, that appears in front of a customer. But if we, if we don't keep on top of automation quality as an organization, um, you will start, it will start to fray at the edges. You will have quality problems and um, you'll run into things. So that constant push pull about stuff now versus make the machine run better. Um, and as in, as engineering people, you know, we should always be looking to get the automation quality right. That way we'll get more stuff. And that's always the argument. Be patient and stuff will flow better. Dependencies, I mentioned in architecture, we must work to minimize dependencies. And then when we when we still do have dependencies, we manage them systematically. Um, this is what you said, manage them closely. Um, but the problem with managing them closely is it takes up all your energy. So we need to minimize the dependencies and what's left, manage them systematically by good planning, good use of planning tools, and um, good dependency management for via systems as opposed to talking and meetings and calls and what have you. So systematic is very, very important there. Supportability and NFRs cannot be bolted on. Um, they tend to be found late and then repair. I say they tend to be, they tended to be, um, but it's a classic thing in organizations um, that these things don't come to requirements um, because they're not, because you can deploy your code without them and they tend not, they cannot get found until late on and that's what trying to recover from them. Um, we did struggle with this in organization. We got much, much, much better at it. Again, part of the whole shift left thing I mentioned earlier, test these things early. Um, if you need to build testing frameworks, if you need to build mocks and stubs and different things to replicate what needs to be done, um, you know, get daily performance tests is a good example. We used to do a performance tests before release. Now we do it every day. That way we can see things coming and deal with them early. So that's a lot of kind of technical process stuff, but just, you know, there's a lot of this about people as well. So roles change. You know, we need to, companies need to invest in people. That's really, really important. And um, it's a threat to people. You know, if people's jobs change, or people's roles change, people can feel threatened. So we need to make sure people don't feel threatened or deal with the, the, the perceived threats. You know, and that's investing in people, be it training, be it coaching, whatever, but definitely it's not, you know, we've changed now, get on with it. The thing about that is unlearning ingrained habits is hard. It's, you know, if you're habituated to a waterfall environment, it's like, well, what else can I squeeze in here? You know, I need to get more in, there's a deadline coming, throw more stuff in, or, you know, we test this stuff later on um, in integrated environments or, or what, but unlearning those habits is hard, especially for the release coming. Um, and the temptation is to, take shortcuts to get stuff in. So, you know, we need to, people to feel that they they will be rewarded for doing things right as opposed to getting things, you know, out the door. Communicate what you're trying to do and why. And that's not just to the hierarchy. You know, we talked about business buy-in, organizational buy-in, but it's important as well for every member of your team or teams and um, to understand why this is happening, why this is being done, why we're changing how they want to do things. Um, I heard someone last year Say, why are we still talking about transformation till we've transformed? And you know, the answer is you're never finished. There's there's no uh, past tense with transformation. As I said, coach changes mindset. And I, I said, coach, as opposed to tell, 
you know, um, especially as leaders and those leaders who are on this, this call um, will know that. You can't just change someone's mindset by telling them to change it. It's got to be coached and it's got to be reinforced. Apply systems thinking, really critical. Um, don't, you know, if parts of the organization are thinking about optimizing their local piece at the expense of the broader whole, the whole organization will suffer. Um, you know, we did have, you know, at one point, relatively siloed organization and siloed but interdependent. So we would frequently have problems where teams could break other teams um, because they're just focused on their own objectives. So again, you know, we have had success in bringing more systems thinking in by part of whether there's information mediators, part of like better communication, so people can see the impact of their work on others. So system thinking is very, very important. Blockchain and pipeline are everyone's responsibility. Again, um, this is a big mindset change from the old days where um, an engineering team would finish something, deploy it and walk away and start working the next thing. Um, through the dashboards that Kieran showed earlier, what we have endeavoured to do is make sure that if something stops or fails, everyone can see. Everyone can see it, and the expectation is the people who own it will, will run to that fire and deal with it and get things moving again. Um, again, it's a systems thinking, it's a mindset thing. Um, you know, oh, my code has caused a problem, I get it sorted and we get things moving again. And finally, don't panic about getting your code in, there's always another bus coming. You do cadence releases and someone says, I need to get this in for this deadline. It's like, no, it'll go the next time. Your individual piece of code may have to wait, but the whole machine as a whole runs much more smoothly. And that's a real mindset thing. So the knowledge of this is, is a human thing, despite all technology and processes, and getting people to understand why it's better sometimes to wait. Okay. I'll hand over to Kiro for conclusions. Yeah, so I'm keeping with an ice team here for the, the conclusions, right? So if, if we talk about the picture on the left first, the iceberg, right? So this is a, a perfect analogy when we were starting out on our journey. You know, we had a goal in mind. We thought we knew what, what lay ahead, but really had, had no idea of the scale of the challenge we'd encounter, you know, the, the learnings we'd uncover, the improvements we'd enable, and um, and the changes we were able to make by taking taking the leap we did, you know, there's lots and lots of challenges, you know, that keep coming up, right? And we have some new technologies now that you know we're building out new pipelines for really innovative work. And um, but, like Richard has said, and I think John mentioned at the start as well, right? It's a never-ending journey. You know, there's a continuous need within R and D to inspect and adapt to ensure we're still going the way we want to go. Now, having said that, you know, it, do not let that deter you from, from taking the leap. It, it is well worth it. On the right-hand side, you know, this is something that resonated with me out of a, a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear, right? So in keeping with the ice team, you know, picture an ice cube that, that's sitting in the center of a room, right? The room is minus 10 degrees. Right, uh, ice has a melting point of zero, and you and your team are spending lots of energy to to take the temperature around the ice cube up from minus ten, right? And um, and you see no change, you see no tangible benefit for all of the energy and work that you put in to move to minus nine, to minus seven, to minus five, right? You're working as hard as you can to to see this benefit that you're trying to realize, uh, but you don't see it, and um, but when you get from minus one to zero, a, a simple change that has been you know, a culmination and a compounding of all of the energy and work that's gone before unleashes this, unleashes this breakthrough moment where you know, the ice is melted and you make that leap forward from a change perspective. You know, I, I don't think at any point we said it's easy, it is challenging, it is hard to transform the way we have, but it is, 100% worth it. So, you know, if you're not using continuous delivery in your group or company today, I, I'd strongly, you know, suggest that you you take the leap. Um, if you are, hopefully you've learned something from today's session. And Richard, if you jump on to the next slide. So just a couple of the, the books that have really shaped, and I think a lot of folks within HP at least would have, you know, read some, if not all of these. 
that have shaped our mindset, shaped what we've talked about in the deck, shaped where we're going from a continuous delivery perspective. Obviously, Dave's book, you know, he was here a couple of weeks ago, the DevOps Handbook, the Accelerate, you know, Flow. There's a lot of mathematics in that book, but really good uh, principles out of it. And there's a couple of good blogs from Jeff Humble and, and Dave on continuous delivery as well. Um, so, yeah, that's it from us.